Hello and welcome to the India Story, the one show that global audiences come to for a deeper understanding of the top stories from India week after week. I'm Vikram Chandra, and tonight would be incomplete without a salute to the team of scientists at ISRO who've created history by not just landing on the moon, but doing so in a remarkable and in a cost-effective manner. India made a soft landing on the South Pole of the Moon, well, next to the South Pole of the Moon, on August the 23rd at 6.04 p.m. And that is our special focus on the show tonight, with top guests from ISRO joining in to explain what this historic achievement means for India, for India's future space programs, and possibly for the world. Also on the show, Prime Minister Narendra Modi has been busy at the BRICS summit at Johannesburg. The group has agreed to let six more countries in. Argentina, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia and UAE. They're all going to become part of the collaborative structure. But the decision does raise questions about the emergence of a new global order. Is this going to be a contender in some sort? And what exactly will be the role that India will continue to play in BRICS and in other groupings like this? With the G20 summit just around the corner, what message are these countries sending to the rest of the world and more prominently to the global north? We're going to be analysing all these aspects shortly. And finally, Gadar 2, the sequel to the super hit Gadar, is grossing big, big numbers at the box office with 500 crores and counting. We speak to Anil Sharma, the director of the film, a little later in the show. But before all of that, a quick look at some of the stories that have been making the headlines this week. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Xi Jinping discussed briefly the border standoff between India and China during an interaction on the sidelines of the BRICS summit at Johannesburg. The Indian Prime Minister conveyed to the Chinese President India's concerns on the unresolved issues along the line of actual control in eastern Ladakh. Um, that conversation, of course, wasn't a formal sit-down meeting. It was a brief interaction on the sidelines. The Foreign Secretary Vinay Quatra said that Prime Minister Modi underlined that the maintenance of peace in border areas and respecting the LAC are essential for the normalization of India-China relations. And clearly, those relations are far from normal right now. There is certainly cold vibes that could be felt even at the BRICS summit in view of the fact that there wasn't actually any formal sit-down bilateral meeting. Overriding the Biden administration's appeal, a US court has ordered a stay on the extradition of Pakistani origin Canadian businessman Tahabur Rana to India, where he's facing a trial for his involvement in the 2008 Mumbai terror attacks. Rana is known to be associated with Pakistani-American terrorist David Coleman Headley, one of the main conspirators of the 2611 Mumbai attacks. United World Wrestling, the world governing body for wrestling, has suspended the Indian Wrestling Federation after it failed to conduct presidential elections within the 45-day deadline. This means that Indian wrestlers will not be allowed to compete under the Indian flag at upcoming events. WFI's elections were originally stated for June, but then protesters from wrestlers against the WFI chief over sexual harassment allegations have caused multiple delays in the process, leading to a rather embarrassing situation. In some great news, India's Ramesh Babu Pragnananda, an 18-year-old chess prodigy, created history this week by becoming the youngest ever to reach the Chess World Cup final. While he eventually went down to world number one Magnus Carlsen in the tiebreaker of the summit clash, he did qualify for the candidates tournament, becoming the first Indian after Vishwanathan Anand to reach that coveted tournament. Big budget blockbusters RRR, Gangubai, Kathiawari and Sardar Udham Singh swept the 69th National Film Awards with six and five awards each in various categories. Bollywood actors Alia Bhatt, Kriti Sanon and Telugu star Alu Arjun backed the top individual honours. However, a political controversy then broke out over the jury's decision to award the best film on national integration to the movie Kashmir Files, which is of course based on the 
Kashmiri Pandit exodus from the Kashmir Valley in the 1990s. And now the big focus this week on the India story because it was a big week for the India story, literally soaring all the way to the moon. Google made a doodle about it. World leaders hailed it. The international media from the BBC to the Washington Post covered it extensively. Even Pakistani news outlets put it on the front page. On the evening of August the 23rd, the ISRO, the Indian Space Agency, shone as bright as the moon, no pun intended. Four years after the Chandrayaan-2 mission ended in some heartbreak, history was scripted by its successor, with the Chandrayaan-3 operating successfully and the Vikram lander landing successfully on the moon. India has become the first nation ever to reach the moon's south pole. India is also part of an exclusive club of just three other nations to have successfully done a soft landing on the lunar surface. In his first comments, Prime Minister Narendra Modi said this was an achievement for all of humankind. And since he was in South Africa for the BRICS summit at the time, he was seen sharing the news with other world leaders there. Here's how it all went down and also what's happening next. We are nearly at zero velocity, vertical and horizontal. We, are, we were hovering and now we are approaching the moon's surface. From tense silence to loud cheers. Lander module puri se safely or softly chandrama ke satah pe land ho chuka hai. This is how the ISRO control room reacted when Chandrayaan-3 performed a flawless landing on the surface of the moon. At 6.04 p.m. on August 23rd, the Vikram lander successfully landed near the south pole of the moon. ISRO called the touchdown perfect since it occurred within 300 meters of the central point of the intended landing site, measuring 4.5 kilometers by 2.5 kilometers. A day later, ISRO announced that the Pragyan rover had successfully rolled out of the Vikram lander and begun exploring the moon. Scientists said that instruments on board, both the lander and the rover, had been switched on to begin their studies. The two modules will study the moon's atmosphere, mineral composition and seismic activity. They are designed to function for one lunar day, which is around 14 Earth days. After this, the area where the lander and rover are will be plunged into darkness and the temperature will drop as low as minus 180 degrees Celsius. While chances are slim, ISRO says that it's possible for the modules to come back to life once the freezing lunar night ends. Whether or not Vikram and Pragyan survive, India's presence has been tattooed on the moon's surface. The rover's rare wheels have an imprint of India's national emblem and ISRO's logo and India's name has literally been stamped on the celestial body. And for more on that, we're now being joined by Madhavan Nair, the former chairman of ISRO. Sir, thanks so much for joining us. Now, one of the major things that's got a lot of people's interest and attention is the cost. How has India been able to do this at such a low cost? And by the way, has that always been the ambition since the time when you were the chairman of ISRO, to do things at a very frugal way? Uh, well, certainly the Indian uh, space program is uh, very cost-effective. Uh, there are several reasons for it. One is the long-term vision and the goals what ISRO sets and uh, work in a systematic manner to achieve those goals. And benefits of whatever we have learned earlier will be uh, utilized for the further advancement of the space program as well. Uh, starting from the 60s onwards, we start uh, the development of the rockets, the satellites, and the application technology has progressed very well. And uh, whatever we have learned in the lessons in that has been reused in various uh, ways. Second, of course, is the homegrown technology. It is entirely within the ISRO laboratories. All these technological challenges are met, and the cost effectiveness of carrying out research in a government setup is unique. Right. So of the major plans that are now being spoken about, whether it's going to Venus or Aditya mission or whether it's a Gaganyan, which do you think is the most important and also the most challenging? Well, all these uh, programs are uh, important and uh, really equally challenging, especially the Gaganyan program, where we are having an ambitious goal of developing a capsule 
which can carry three astronauts to the lower orbit, uh, sustain them for about a week or two, and bring them back safely is going to be the most uh, challenging uh, assignment for ISRO in the near future. And let's now get some more perspective on that from Professor Arup Dasgupta, former Deputy Director of ISRO. Professor Dasgupta, great talking to you because now the euphoria is going to give way to the actual science. And I wanted to really spend some time with you to understand the science that is now going to be done. What are going to be the key highlights of this mission in the days ahead? Well, as you know that uh, actually there are the three elements uh, of the whole Chandrayaan-3. Uh, the first, of course, is the uh, what we call as a propulsion module, which incidentally also, also has a sensor. Then we have the uh, Vikram lander, which has, uh, I think, three major sensors. And then we have the Pragyan rover, which has two major sensors. So why the moon is interesting to us now is that there are possibilities of starting a moon base, a moon base from where we can then jump on to other planetary explorations. If you want to set up a moon base, then what do you need? So all the efforts that uh, 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 the Chandrayaan-3 is going to put in is essentially trying to find out what are the things that are there. So I guess the most important part of the next 14 days is really going to be the search for, for water because what you were saying about a moon base, if we are to ever set up a moon base, then water will be really essential and required for that. So a big, big headline from this would be if the rover can actually find water on the surface of the moon. Absolutely correct. Water is going to be the key discovery. Uh, second discoveries are going to be minerals, minerals which can be used for fabrication and for uh, creation of items. For example, titanium is one of the things we're looking at because titanium is very much uh, required if you're looking at, uh, you know, uh, setting up uh, a kind of moon base and things like that. So these are the two things. Plus, we are also looking at the environment of the moon. For example, there, there are most probably moon quakes. So if they are there, what is their uh, uh, strength? What is their structure? How do they originate? This is something we want to look at. I guess from an Indian point of view, uh, there will be this entire question of whether living on the moon or having a moon base is at all feasible. I know the Americans are planning another manned mission to the moon very soon. And at the end of the day, they are the only people who have been able to actually get a human being to the moon. India still has to figure out how to get an astronaut into space, and that's what Gaganyaan is going to be about in the next uh, couple of years. So the question of a moon base for us right now, is that something further in the future and for the moment, perhaps something that we would be working with the Americans and others with because we have signed the Artemis Accords? I think it's going to be a cooperative effort, and that's why I think we have signed the Artemis Agreement. Mm -hmm. If you look at the Artemis Agreement, uh, it, it allows us to work within the within the parameters of the UN resolutions. But at the same time, it also gives us a certain leeway in terms of commercial uh, activities. For example, let me say that with the Chandrayaan-3 now there, we can actually define, as per the Artemis report, we can define a safety zone where nobody else should come and disturb us. It's more or less like a stakeout. And I, I also need to look at, you know, what we have done, for example, in Antarctica. The situation in Antarctica today is, is what the situation on the moon is going to be maybe a decade from now. That's a really interesting point you're making, Professor Das Gupta. And one of the reasons why the success of Chandrayaan-3 has been so important, it needs to be underlined. You're saying that there is, uh, for all intents and purposes, an Indian flag on the moon. That means that India has now got certain rights as per the Artemis Accords on the moon. And therefore, in all probability, the actual effort to, may, uh, to make a base may be led by somebody else, but India has got some rights. Are you saying that we should therefore now work with the Americans uh, on that? Most probably uh, um, with the Americans because we have signed an accord, but then the Chinese are also going to set up their own efforts. The Russians, I don't know, but they may also try. I think we keep our options open. Well, I think it's rather unlikely that India would actually be partnering with China right now. Russia could be possible. Russia was intended to be a partner for India. 
but the Russian space program seems to have fallen off a little bit in, in recent years. Yeah, the Russian uh, space program has really uh, taken a beating, and, and the uh, loss of Lunar 25 exactly shows that. Uh, but uh, part of it with China, where well, stranger things have happened. Right, I, mean, I, I would be surprised if it was with China, but who knows, as you, as you rightly said. Now, sir, as somebody who's been Deputy Director of ISRO, it's obviously been quite a journey from the Vikram Sarabhai days and those pictures we still see everywhere of rocket cones being you know, wheeled around on cycles. What do you think is the secret of ISRO's success? Is it, in particular, the ability to do things at a really low cost? And that's one of the things that everyone has been marvelling about, how low the costs are of the Indian space missions? Yeah, I think, you know, it really starts with uh, Professor Sarabhai. You know, the kind of excitement that he brought, even in those early days, 1969, 1970, the kind of excitement that he brought, bringing together a lot of people, you know, with the, uh, and, and virtually the kind of people, I mean, the people who joined. If you read some of their books, uh, I mean, they, they took a big risk. The whole thing could have fallen flat. But it was Vikram Sarabhai who really got it going. And although he died an untimely death, and in fact, he died when we were really starting to grow, Professor Dhawan was a fantastic person. I mean, he really built ISRO into what it is today, putting together different divisions into different centers, focusing the centers on specific activities. That, that, that really set the path. As far as the frugal part of it is concerned, we, we Indians are generally very frugal. And our approach towards any design of that sort is frugality is definitely one. The other is self-reliance. Uh, sir, do you think a critical base has now been set up and it comes to technology in both space and defence? I mean, country in defence, for example, has countries like HAL, which are both in defence and in space. And that critical mass is sometimes required uh, for India to become a major tech power in its own right and then self-reliance in every sense of the word both in space and perhaps in defense as well. Has that base been set up by now? Yes, why not? Because actually, if you really look at it, if you look at the whole Chandrayaan effort, you know, the number of private industries which have contributed to it is enormous. I mean, starting from the big ones like l and and uh, Midhani and so forth, and going down to even small MSMEs, very significant uh, uh, you know, support has been given. So we now have built the base. And in fact, now we can really look at commercializing many of the things that we have developed. And we are doing that. Right, sir. Well, one last question. Looking ahead a little bit now, obviously, we're going to be looking at what Pragyan Rover finds on the moon in the next 14 days. There could be some very big headlines coming out of there, especially in case water is actually found. Other than that, the Aditya mission is there. But Gaganyan, is Gaganyan going to be the thing that you have your the eye really on? Getting an Indian on an Indian spacecraft into space. Would that be the next big one? Obviously. In terms of the headlines, that will be a big uh, one. But it's going to take time. Because uh, once you involve human beings, you have to be not only careful, but you have to be super careful. You know, you. I mean, typical engineering thing is that once a human is involved, all safety factors are 1.5 times whatever you calculate. So this is going to take uh, time. But I see a lot of small, small, small steps which are really, uh, which are maybe not going to create that kind of headlines, but which are really important. Aditya L1 for science is a fantastic step forward. Uh, NISA, which is basically again a, a joint ISRO uh, uh, NASA effort, is also going to be very, very important. Uh, then we are having a launch of our own uh, weather satellite. I think inside 3D, um, inside, um, I forget the name. Anyway, it's, it's going to be there. So these are also, you know, there are things which are happening, uh, which are really very important for our total effort. Gaganyan, yes, it, 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 ultimately we have to uh, get that technology in our hand, but then it's, it's tough to get that technology. And apparently for the Gaganyan project, we're first going to be putting some sort of a robo into space to see what happens, and then eventually moving up to humans, which I guess is the, is the right way to do it. Yeah, that's what's going to happen. In fact, the next test is actually an abort test. That is, suppose everything has gone wrong. How do you save the uh, man capsule and take it away from the rocket? Right, Professor Das Gupta.
former deputy director of ISRO. Exciting times at a bot mission, Robo, and then humans in space. These are exciting times for ISRO and for India. Thank you so much for being with us. Right, so the success of Chandrayaan-3 obviously dominated the international headlines this week. But now let's move to our regular segment of tracking what the global media is saying about India. Here are some of the other top stories from across the world related uh, to India. The Financial Times has praised the new UPI feature that allows users to use AI language tools to make payments in a more safe and secure manner. It says that about 350 users already there for UPI in their seven years. It calls UPI one of the most successful payment systems in the world. And it says that to expand its reach and bridge the urban rural digital divide is really crucial. And it says that the new feature could prove to be a game changer in that. So UPI getting some more good press. Meanwhile, uh, the BBC quoting a recent study in the Nature Journal says the Himalayas are now getting more rain where there used to earlier be mostly snow. And this change is making the mountains more dangerous because higher temperatures are causing both rain and the faster melting of snow and ice. This report is significant actually because torrential rains and ongoing construction are clearly causing significant damage and loss of life, especially in states like Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand in this monsoon season. India's moon mission signs an uncomfortable light on Russia's failure. So there was that interesting opinion piece in CNN, which shard praise, of course, on the remarkable progress of India's space program. However, it also pointed to the contrast with Russia, which, of course, faced another setback following the failure of its comeback space mission, Luna 25. According to CNN, Russia was in the urgent need for a successful lunar mission to demonstrate its continued greatness despite the setbacks it's facing in Ukraine. But Russia's failure uh, only underlines the fact that a nation that was once the front-runner in space programs is now giving way a little bit to the prowess of other countries in the space sector, most notably India. So that rather interesting opinion piece in CNN. And on that note, let's move to the other big focus we have for you this week, which is the BRIC summit that was taking place even as India was making that successful soft landing on the south pole of the moon. Now, BRICS, lots and lots of questions around it. Some major developments this week, not the least of which was an expansion of BRICS. What does it all mean? Well, let, let's first understand some of the challenges around BRICS, especially when it comes to India. And let's start by listening to a short audio clip. Now that was a recording of Sajid Mir, a lashkar e taiba terrorist sitting in Pakistan's Karachi in 2008 and directing the 26 11 attacks in Mumbai. India played that clip virtually in front of the entire world at the United Nations General Assembly in June this year. India was forced to do this after China blocked yet again a proposal at the UN Security Council to designate Sajid Mir a global terrorist and impose sanctions on him. It's a script which plays out again and again and again at various international fora. China blindly pursuing its anti-India and anti-West policies at the cost of just about anything, even innocent lives. Last year, Beijing blocked action by the United Nations against two Lashkar terrorists, including the son of the group's chief, Hafiz Saeed. Last month, Xi Jinping tried to use the Shanghai Cooperation Organization to legitimize his Belt and Road Initiative, which of course illegally runs through Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. India refused to sign that particular paragraph in the joint declaration. Back in 2019, India had walked out of the world's largest trade agreement, RCEP, because of terms and conditions which leaned heavily in China's favor. But a big question today is, will India now have to worry about all of this at the BRICS grouping as well? And there are some people who will say, India always had to worry about it because let's face it, China is a very major and in economic terms, frankly, a dominant factor at BRICS. Now, here's why we, this question is particularly relevant. 
BRICS is set to become even bigger, with the expansion of membership announced on the last day of this year's summit. Six countries have been invited to become new members. These include Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Iran, Egypt, Argentina and Ethiopia. The new membership will be effective from January the 1st next year, but this is just the first step. With the South African President Ramphosa saying more such expansion phases will follow. After the announcement, Prime Minister Narendra Modi welcomed the new members by saying that this was an effort to make global bodies more inclusive and representative. However, India has been pretty cautious on the issue of expanding BRICS. Delhi had earlier said that while it's open to the idea, there was a need to clarify criteria, procedures and most importantly, principles for expanding the group. The reason for this caution is obvious. China and even Russia are looking for ways to counter the influence that America and its allies have on global bodies and institutions. Both Beijing and Moscow have been hit by sanctions imposed by the West. Now, while Russia has been targeted over the Ukraine war, China has faced action for several reasons, from spying on other countries to government excesses in Xinjiang, Hong Kong and Tibet. Here's what Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin might be hoping to achieve through an expanded and powerful BRICS. They may want to showcase to the West their influence over underdeveloped countries. Moscow and Beijing may try to leverage this alleged influence to strike deals and negotiate with the USA and its allies. Xi and Putin may also try to challenge the West leadership at the United Nations and other such bodies by claiming to be the voices of the global South. Now for India, obviously it is a tightrope walk out here. India doesn't want to hold BRICS back, but India does have good relations with the West itself. India doesn't necessarily want to be playing to some sort of a China agenda, but at the same time India does want a multipolar world and does want to be seen as a leader of that multipolar world by the Global South. India has always been a champion of the Global South all the way from the non-aligned movement day. So there are lots of pulls and pressures out here and a bit of a tightrope walk that India is walking. And we're going to be talking to experts about this in just a short while from now. But the first and the most immediate question to ask is, will the new members of BRICS, those which have just been inducted, will they be proving or dispelling India's worst fears? Let's just take a brief look at which side of the fence each of them is on. Let's start with Saudi Arabia. Now, it has seen tension rise with the US recently, over some moves by OPEC, uh, which did benefit Russia to some extent, OPEC plus in particular. Um, of course, Saudi Arabia has been an American ally in the past. So again, it's trying to do its own balancing act in some sort or the other. Meanwhile, China recently brokered the resumptions of ties between Riyadh and Tehran. So that's another factor that has to be kept in mind. There have also been some differences between Saudi Arabia and USA over the question of human rights as well as over the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Um, amid all of this, Sino-Saudi energy ties have been soaring. A $3.6 billion deal was struck in March. So Saudi Arabia, a traditional ally of the US, has been moving somewhat more to the center and moving somewhat in the, in the Chinese direction, but it's clearly not in the China camp right now. Next, let's take a look at the United Arab Emirates, which has been unhappy with the US over its inaction when it comes to Iran, Egypt and Syria. The Middle East power has also been growing closer to Russia since the start of the Ukraine war. And another blow to the US in the region, the UAE said it had withdrawn from the America-led combined maritime forces. But at the same time, it should be remembered that the UAE has always had very close relations with the Americans. And of course, it's also part of, for example, this new grouping that has been just set up I2U2, which stands for Israel, India, the USA and the UAE. So another balancing act happening out there. Now Iran. Iran's an interesting question and an open book there. Tensions with America over its nuclear program have been exacerbated by face-offs in the Strait of Hormuz. Meanwhile, Tehran has been accused of supplying attack drones to Russia for use in the Ukraine. Iran also relies economically and diplomatically on China. So no, no real question over which side of the fence Iran actually stands. The fourth new member, Egypt. 
Now, it has been one of the top recipients of American aid in the past, but it is China which is now a major part of the project to build the new Egyptian capital. Egypt's dependence on the US dollar has also backfired somewhat since the Ukraine war began. Meanwhile, Russia is building Egypt's first nuclear power plant. So, balance category, I guess. The USA's neighbor to the south, well, some distance to the south, Argentina. Now, that's another interesting case. It's battling hyperinflation and it has been struggling to make debt repayments to the IMF, in which the US is a dominant force. Meanwhile, China has been striking yuan currency swap lifelines and a $3 billion infrastructure and lithium deals with Buenos Aires. Balancing act again. Finally, Ethiopia, which has been engaged in a confrontation with America for alleged war crimes in Tigray. Now, to gain strategic advantage, China has criticized American sanctions on Ethiopia and has also pledged reconstruction aid for war-town areas. So all of these countries are, I would say, in the balance zone. Some of them are drifting away from America and closer to China. But does India need to worry? Not necessarily. India does have close ties with most of these new BRICS members. Egypt, UAE, Saudi Arabia, all are close allies of India. They've conferred their highest honors on Prime Minister Narendra Modi in recent years. But of course, there are hurdles too. Iran has accused India of making slow progress in the Chabahar port. India has also stopped buying Iranian oil due to the threat of US sanctions. But China continued to buy it. Meanwhile, in May this year, Egypt joined Saudi Arabia and China along with some other countries in skipping the G20 event held in Kashmir, which wasn't necessarily a good sign to New Delhi. Now, China may try and play on all of these tensions to try and ring fence India at BRICS too. And this is more or less a given, given the chill in relations between Delhi and Beijing right now, which show no signs of easing up. This phase, of course, started with China's military aggression in Ladakh in 2020. And 19 rounds of military level talks have been held since then to try and defuse the crisis, but progress has been limited. China is showing no signs of stepping back. The last round of discussions were held just days before the BRICS summit began but without any concrete outcome. Now, this year's BRICS summit, the Chinese President Xi Jinping was very combative against the West. Without naming America, Xi Jinping said that a country which is obsessed with maintaining its hegemony has been going out of its way to cripple emerging markets and developing countries. He added that BRICS is not creating bloc confrontation, but will help make the international order what he called just and equitable. Xi also said that BRICS will continue to grow despite any resistance. The Russian President Vladimir Putin was also very vocal against the West, claiming that de-dollarization of economic ties between BRICS countries was irreversible and was gaining momentum. These statements essentially show the vision that Russia and China have for a bigger BRICS grouping. They would like it to be an anti-West grouping of some sort or the other. Now, at this year's summit, India may have been able to walk the tightrope and avoid a fierce confrontation with China. This is because just weeks from now, India will be hosting the G20 summit. All the original BRICS nations are part of G20. India will be looking to ensure full attendance of all G20 leaders at the summit, including Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping. Delhi will also be trying to get China and Russia to cooperate in G20 discussions on finalizing the post-summit declaration and other issues like that. There will also be a diplomatic attempt to try and find some sort of a middle ground on contentious issues looming over G20 like Ukraine. So it is in India's interest to try and keep that BRICS movement moving forward somewhat slowly. May also be the reason why that expansion has taken place. So what should India do about BRICS now? The biggest responsibility of New Delhi as a senior partner is to make sure that BRICS does not end up being a rubber stamp in China's campaign to be a dominant superpower. India needs to ensure that BRICS acts like a credible voice for the global south, which is broadly the term for less developed countries. They have been in the sidelines of global decision making and they need their place in the sun. But it has to be done in a correct and in a balanced manner.
And for more on the implications on all of that, two real experts in the field, Ambassador Navdeep Suri joining us, as is Zorawar Dulat Singh, author and historian. Thank you both so much uh, for being with us. Uh, Amb Ambassador uh, Suri, why don't you start off? What do you think was the, if the key highlight of, the, of this particular summit was the expansion of BRICS, how do you think India should react to that? Be happy about it, be unhappy about it, say there was no other choice? My sense is, uh, Vikram, that it's a mixed bag. Um, we were, um, let me say, not particularly enthusiastic about the expansion. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we understand what the criteria are. Um, and uh, uh, I think what we've been able to uh, succeed in getting uh, is that at least the members that have uh, been inducted, most of them are countries with whom we have very good relations, um, particularly Egypt, UAE, Saudi Arabia. Uh, what we didn't want uh, was a situation where China is able to use the expansion to back the BRICS with its um, uh, friends or, or, or worse than friends, you know, uh, countries on which it can exert a degree of pressure. Zoravar, what would be your take on the BRICS summit? See, uh, I would say the context of today with the ongoing great power conflict in Europe, uh, major crisis again in globalization, weaponization of public goods by the US. I think all this has put BRICS in a, at a juncture where it needs to sort of take stock of where it wants to go. I think the decision that they've taken collectively is now the business as usual approach of gradually chugging along and waiting for the West to get its act together isn't working. So I think they've stepped up by broadening the membership. These states, as you know, are major commodity exporters. It also links up the, the decision to take these specific states uh, will also help in de-risking the global financial system. So there's a little bit of that, not say de-dollarization, but a dollar plus system where you're going to have uh, a critical mass or of, of economies that can now choose to do uh, something else with the revenues that they get from the export. So that's happening. But I think uh, on the whole, uh, India would have liked to perhaps slow it down to some extent. But I think ultimately the choice is if you want a multipolar interconnected world, you're going to have to have more actors come on board with you. And I think that was the call of the time, really. Uh, Zorava, there's, there's this perception that India may want to slow things down with BRICS just a little bit. Is that essentially because India doesn't want a China-dominated organization to be really you know, gathering too much traction? And let's face it, China, at least economically, does have a lot of weightage when it comes to BRICS. Uh, China does try to use that in other groupings as well, like SCO. So is that really the reason why India has to walk that tightrope walk? It doesn't want a China-dominated organization. So, so, you know, this is one of the, I would say, uh, uh, impressions out there that this is a China-dominated body. But if you look at the charter of BRICS and the way decision-making occurs, it is through consensus. India has a veto power, in a sense. I mean, it's not going to use it just brazenly. It, it wants a constructive solution. So this is the opposite of the Bretton Woods. You had a major superpower that would get its job done because it had client states. You can't say that about the BRICS. I mean, no matter what you say about the other states other than China, they're all proud, strong, independent states, right? They may be an asymmetry of GDP, but there's enough capacity, national capacities. So I would say a BRICS, even with 10 members, will still have the basic framework. I would actually flip the question and say, why are the Chinese doing this by restraining what they could do on its own? And the reason for that is very simple. They cannot because of a variety of reasons, have the type of influence that they have in a unilateral way. I think some of it is through lessons of the past, but also they simply don't have the soft power or the ability to project their, uh, their vision of the world in a unilateral way. So they have to, in a sense, compromise. They have to be in a multilateral setting. So they're investing in this for the same reason that we are. Right, Ambassador Suri, on the question of what I think China may have wanted or Russia would have wanted is to set up this entire organization as something which is in direct opposition to the West, right? The anti-West or the not-West is what they would have probably preferred. Now, 
They've been able to get BRIC, Iran into BRICS also, which may well want the same thing, something which is anti-West. But that has to be counterbalanced by the fact that countries like India and perhaps the UAE and Saudi Arabia aren't necessarily hostile to the West either. So I think, I think uh, you know, if you use two expressions and they are not the same, uh, it is not anti-West, it is not the West. It's an alternate uh, 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 perspective on a lot of issues. And I, I think the reason why we've seen a fair bit of give and take during this summit is because there's a recognition amongst the five uh, founding BRIC members uh, now, you could say, or the four, and, and South Africa as the fifth, uh, that we have a, a unique window of opportunity over the next th two years. This is the first time that you had India as a BRICS member taking the G20 presidency. Uh, Brazil is next, and after that is South Africa. And the fact that the three members of BRICS back to back for three years have an opportunity uh, to, to shape some of the discourse in G20 uh, and, 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 and create a degree of convergence on uh, multilateral financial institutions, on uh, payment mechanisms, on climate finance, on whole host of issues that matter, matter to the global south. Uh, I think that is uh, the perspective of not the West, that you can't have all these large organizations uh, or select organizations dominated only by a Western perspective. There is an alternate uh, view which matters. Right. right. Uh, um, Zurab, it's also interesting to look at what didn't happen, right? The currency, the talk of the, there'd be some sort of a BRICS currency, that has not happened. And clearly, relation between India and China still being somewhat frosty. There was a meeting on the sidelines uh, that did happen, but not some sort of a formal sit-down, you know, detailed conversation. Yeah, so coming to the, uh, the India-China bit, I think that's, a work in progress in a sense. I think both sides are trying to see if they can stabilize the the, the border crisis, but that, I, I don't think we should link that here. I mean, if it, it at some stage it may, may happen, might not happen. And I think both sides are holding on to their position. They might adjust them. On the, on the dollar bit, uh, uh, yes, uh, to have a common currency, which was sort of painted as the ultimate benchmark of a non-dollar system, I think that's obviously complicated. Uh, these countries are not like the European Union, where they've ceded almost everything to a supranational authority in Brussels, which then reports to Washington, right? So this is a these are sovereign states. They want to protect their central banks. So they will have to find different ways to create this de-risk system. Part of it is happening through trade in your local currencies, which frankly has already begun. It's just the scale will increase. Now, it's actually to be interesting to be seen how Saudi Arabia, Iran, uh, which are major commodity producers and exporters, how they will denominate their exports. All right, last word from you, Ambassador Suri. Where does BRICS go from here? Well, you know, uh, I, I just, because it's such an important point about the, the, uh, the BRICS currency. I think the reason it's way too early for that is that there isn't any kind of consensus at this point of time amongst the members on what form would it take. And, and the Chinese clearly have been pushing it because in their metrics, it would be a yuan dominated uh, currency. And that's something that's not acceptable to several other uh, players. Uh, I, I, I think where what where we are heading is uh, many more bilateral trading arrangements, and I think uh, something that hasn't really caught people's attention is that India and UAE have done the, their first oil trade worth $62 million uh, in uh, uh, our respective local currencies, and that's quite a big deal, actually. Uh, and, and if that's the uh, pathway where uh, commodity trading uh, happens, you will probably see not the de-dollarization, but at least a progressive slide uh, down of the dollar. Where does it go from here? I, I, th I think uh, the uh, expanded BRICS when it meets uh, uh, next year and when the meetings of the various working groups uh, uh, start from uh, January, um, it will create uh, uh, new avenues for, uh, for these countries. It will give more weight 
to uh, the uh, uh, the uh, formulations that we put forth, whether in New York or in uh, Geneva, whether in WTO or in uh, uh, other places. So right. I think there's a there's a there's a positive note on which uh, I think uh, this uh, particular summit has ended. All right, I'd like to thank both of you for those really really valuable um, uh, insights into what's been happening at BRICS. And finally, it's been one of the most talked about films in India in recent months. And actually, it's been a really fantastic year, hasn't it, for the Indian movie industry. Now, movie buffs say that this film, when released way back in 2001, 22 years ago, was not just another film, but an emotion on them. The sequel to the movie, Gadar, is back and has brought with it tons of nostalgia, the magic of Tara Singh, and, well, crores and crores and crores of rupees at the box office. One of the most talked about Bollywood action masala movies in recent times, Gadar, has literally created that. A Gadar, or Havoc, at the box office. It's smashing records set by many other blockbusters like Bahubali and Dangal, and is by far the biggest second week grosser. The film already has its 500 crore rupee mark in the kitty, and by the looks of theatres running houseful, it seems like it's just the start. Gadar 2 ended with an ambiguous to-be-continued message. Does that mean Gadar 3 is on the cards? Let's now ask the director himself. It's a great pleasure to be joined by Anil Sharma, the director of Gadar. Anil Sharma ji, first of all, many, many congratulations. What a spectacular success you have on your hands. Thank you very much. Uh, it's God blessing and the people's love for Gadar 1 and that's why Gadar 2 has uh, such a magnificent opening and start and people are loving it and I'm, I'm really thrilled and enjoying it. The God has given, the people wanted me to do Gadar 2 and I delivered what they wanted and I'm, I'm really happy for that. Yes, people wanted to do Gadar 2 but we waited 20 years for the sequel. Why did you wait for so long? Were you thinking that people perhaps have forgotten about Tara Singh? Gadarko to log bhule hi nahi the Tara Singh jitna samay ja raha tha Tara Singh aur unke dil mein utarta ja raha tha jeete aur unke dil mein utarta ja raha tha Sakina was going in deep into their hearts and the only reason why I never wanted to just choose the uh, Gadar uh, I just never wanted to encash the Gadar I just wanted to deliver the Gadar to the real Gadar story the continuation of Gadar the katha continue so I wanted uh, uh, I wanted a story with, uh, which I was trying to develop it, trying to develop it, but it was not developing. One fine day, it happened. Right. Uh, well, would you have still made that particular sequel if Sunny Diol or Amisha had uh, not agreed to do it after such a long time? Uh, how could how can I make without Tara Singh? I cannot make Tara Singh. Has to be Tara Singh. But if you deliver the story, if you uh, actor ki kamzori kya hai kahani? Agar the moment he loved the story. Uh, uh, picture banegi banegi. Agar actor ko kahani pasand aayegi to banegi banegi. The moment I went and I narrated the small idea to the Sunny Deol, there was a big tear in his eyes. So I know it's 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 done. What was the experience like directing your son Utkarsh in such a pivotal role? But I have already directed him in uh, Gadar One. He, he was kid in that film. And probably it is the first film where the, 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 the person who has played the kid, he's playing the elder also. So, uh, uh, on the contrary, it was good. Because whenever I used to cut his close-ups of uh, his uh, uh, Gadar 1, so it used to connect uh, deeply with the audience. That is what happening. That is what paying me off. Because whenever I, I cut his close-up, you have not seen the film, so you don't know. Whenever I cut his close-ups, uh, uh, the, uh, the other one and I come back and again show this close. It connects so much because it's the same child. Uh, Sharma, obviously one of the major factors behind the success of both Gadar 1 and Gadar 2, quite frankly, is it that patriotic element, somebody going into Pakistan and beating up Pakistanis, is that one of the elements in both the films actually that have contributed to them being, being such, a, such hits? Yeah, yeah, patriotism is a uh, great, uh, uh, great thing and uh, people love that, people feel that and in Gadar, 
uh, one or other two, especially in other two, there's a lot of patriotism in, and people, uh, get, uh, matlab, logo ke goosebumps aa jate hai, and uh, of course, going to Pakistan and uh, uh, doing things there. I'm not shown in other two ke, uh, Pakistan in a bad light. A person is sh uh, shown in a bad light. That person can be in India also, that person can be in England also, that person can be in Pakistan also. Well, the franchise culture is so big abroad, so I'm sure you must already be thinking about the possibility of Gadar 3. What could possibly happen there? Tara Singh, return to the screens once again. You know, perhaps go to the moon and fight aliens out there, something like that. If the, uh, the story comes, I'll make. Uh, send, them to the, send them to the moon, rescue some people out there. <laughs> No, so we are on the move. Already, I must congratulate uh, entire India and everyone, you and me, everyone, that we are on the moon now. Okay, Anilji, we'll keep our eye out for Gadar 3. Thank you so much for joining us. And that's all we have for you on this episode of the India Story. But do join us next week as we bring to our global audiences the big stories coming out of India and the top experts to tell you what they all mean. Thanks a lot for watching. I'm Vikram Chandra. We'll be back next week.